If he had advice for Ukuri Atani right now, he's probably listening to you as we speak. Cabinet Secretary, what would you tell him? Some jobs are career killing. He should have stayed in the Ministry of Labor. There are some jobs that if you're offered, you, you decline. You say, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the confidence you have in me. But I think I'm doing very well in the Ministry of Labor. This is just setting me up. For failure. Exactly. The 3.6 trillion shilling budget. Highest ever. And when you look at the numbers, well, I can only say they're scary. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Because there is a big hole in there somewhere of 1.2, about a little over 1.2, maybe even 1.3 trillion shillings, a deficit. What does that mean? It means we may have to borrow, obviously. We'll have to borrow and borrow and borrow. And if we're in more dead, when whew. Why don't we break down some of the numbers as much as we can as we anticipate or approach this D-Day Thursday. Joining us live in the studio, economic analyst Reginald Kazutu. He's been looking at the numbers, literally. He's crunching the numbers as we speak. Reginald, welcome to Out96. Thank you, Jeff. Good to see you, my friend. How's everything? Everything is well. Except the numbers don't add up. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers are not adding up. But they've never added up for quite a while. <laughs> they've actually never added up for quite... And that's why we, we are where we are right now. Yeah. Because most of the numbers really never added up for quite a while. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the legislative arm, which approves these numbers, um, have, have not been strict on Treasury. Um, if, if you look at the numbers for this year and if you look at the budget report yes. given by um, the Parliamentary Committee uh, on Finance, we are close to 27 MPs, 27 brains meet to look at these numbers. Uh, there was nothing that was reduced from that 3.6. Uh, they actually came up that there are additional 240 billion requests uh, and they want to prioritize 45-46. And if you look at that 45-46 that is being prioritized, uh, it is nothing either here or, um, or, or there. You're looking at an additional 125 million to State Department of uh, Mining, uh, Operationalization of Mining Act, um, pretty much the current expenditure, State Department of Crop Development, 500 million, um, National Value Chain Support Program, uh, yeah, and, and, and the list goes on. The State Department of Planning, an additional 18 billion to finance national government CDF areas. So my question comes in, as in when Treasury was making its budget, were, were these things not uh, not known that the MPs are now adding, uh, which is close to another 45, uh, 46. Um, there is an additional 1.5 billion to the IEBC for purchase of a building. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 1.5 B. Yeah, for, for purchase of a building. Um, oh there is an additional 2.6 billion for recruitment for 5,200 secondary teachers. So I'm thinking when Yatani and team were making their budget, mm -hmm. For education, which is a recurrent expenditure, uh, had they not factored in some of uh, of these numbers? Right. So yes, the numbers don't add up, and I, I think the main problem we have actually as a country is um, reckless expenditure. Reckless expenditure, and which means there will be a deficit of how much plus minus? Uh, the one Yatani had brought was nine hundred something, but we are now looking up up, up to one point one uh, trillion. Uh, why, why do I say that? 1.1 to 1.2 trillion, because if you have a deficit of around 990 billion, and on average, from the statistics that come from uh, Treasury themselves, KRA on average in the last uh, four or five uh, cycles have been missing their um, uh, target by around 220, 230 billion. So we expect from what they expect KRA to, to collect uh, this year, which is around 2 trillion, uh, they would miss that by close to 200, 250. So, on Yatani's uh, deficit, add another 220 billion. That's a bigger hole. That's a bigger hole. Before now, you add this 46.8 billion that the parliament has said needs to be added um, on it. And the interesting thing from the budget committee report on the 2021 uh, budget policy statement, uh, there's actually very, if there's any decrease that was there, um, it's, it's not even more than 5 billion out of a 3.6 uh, trillion. So when you hear talks of austerity uh, and people saying, no, we're overspending, then all the people who are charged with doing this, no one is actually after reducing anything in the right, budget. Right. Um, after Parliament talked to different departments, they come up with a bigger bill of 240 billion that they wanted to be added, then just prioritize the 46. So 
the hole is big. Uh, the hole is going to be bigger um, if the economy doesn't perform um, uh, very well. Yeah. Because the interesting thing, Jeff, um, if you look at the budget policy statement and you look at the GDP numbers that they are using mm. to project that statement, um, so you find they have 10.1 trillion as the GDP for 2019, uh, which is pretty much close to what was actually the GDP. But what is interesting is that uh, in, in their projections they have 11.1 trillion GDP for 2020. Now, if they said it only grew by 0.6%, and IMF says it dropped by negative 1%, and if previous year was 10.1 trillion, how then do you have a GDP figure for 2020, which is 9% higher than the previous year? Mm -hmm. And the GDP figure that they've used to do their budget and their planning for 2021 is 12.389 trillion. That means from 2019 to now, uh, Kenyan economy will have grown by close to 24 percent, which is ridiculous. Which is which is hideous. Yes. Um, and the most hideous thing that is there is we are in June. We don't know what Q4 GDP was, 2020. We actually don't know what GDP for 2020 was. So the question now comes in: which data and which statistics did they use to come up with this budget? And 2020, not forget, is a Corona year. So. Yeah, exactly. Growth was pretty much negative. Yeah, exactly. So you you've blindly made a policy because whatever you did last year you don't have data to see whether did it create the jobs that you wanted did it uh, create the growth that we wanted so you have no place to look back and say uh, this thing did not work what we tried last year did not work so when you don't have those figures then you come and create a budget for 2021-2022 uh, it, it begs the question on what data are you using to make that or are you just jumping off a cliff blindly hoping whatever hit you the last time does not hit you again is the situation that we are in tell me something Reginald does that mean obviously it means we're gonna to have to be borrowing even more uh, definitely uh, once you have a deficit um, you have to borrow to fix the deficit because you have uh, projected your revenue and you said you're getting two trillion in revenue but our budget is 3.6 so where do we get the rest you just have to uh, you have to borrow unfortunately um, but even before we even go to borrowing, <laughs> that, that two trillion that KRA wants uh, is being funded from taxes which are going up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have the minimum tax that came in. Yes. Um, I, I guess the people that benefited on the financing of the budget side is the health sector. Mo most of the things became exempt. But the interesting thing, as in which again I don't understand, you move plastic syringes and other syringes from being exempt. To vertebral at 16 percent in a hospital what is the most thing that is used in a hospital syringe. if it's not a syringe so you exempt everything else then you say we're going to charge VAT on the thing that yeah so you realize consultancy might actually become very expensive in the hospital getting your blood drawn labs and everything anything that needs a syringe uh, will go up with the vertebral uh, amount including corona jabs including corona jabs so as much as you've made them exempt on the other side, yeah. but then you've come to charge VAT on, on the syringe, which, which doesn't make sense. Uh, another way they are uh, getting this two trillion is they put 16% VAT on milk for infants, uh, powdered milk, uh, this milk yeah. that, that you get. And I'm thinking, I, I thought you want a healthier nation. Why are you making it more expensive for mothers to buy powdered milk for their children? It's now vertible at 16%. Uh, and I think what will hit most people is bread. Yeah. has also been included to be vertebrate at uh, 16%. So it's going to be an expensive year in terms of cost of living uh, because they have to fund this hole that they keep on uh, creating. Then that is still not enough. They still have to now go and borrow uh, the additional 1.1, 1.5 trillion. Just to put it into context, uh, current interest payment budgeted this year around 460, call it an odd 500 billion. Interest Just payment alone, alone on debt. Yeah, that's not even including um, pr any principal payment they have to pay. Yeah, remember all the waivers they have from Paris Club and at June. Mm -hmm. So in the year 2021, 2022 financial year, they will be paying back now the principal payments, including the ones that they had not paid before. So we're already looking at it maybe close to 700, 800 uh, billion. Mm -hmm. They have a pension liability of close to 135, uh, 200 billion. So the whole hole that is being borrowed is literally being borrowed to go pay debt. 
it is not going to development, it's not going to add anything to economic value, it's literally borrowing to go pay debt. Yeah? yeah. Which meaning that next year we don't see how the economy is going to grow enough for them to say now we need to borrow to borrow uh, to borrow less. Most people talk about the external debt, uh, that we're borrowing a lot in dollars and all that stuff. Uh, but actually what we need to be worried about is even our local debt. Because in these numbers, uh, 300 and something billion is actually domestic interest. Yeah? We borrow cheaper outside than we actually borrow locally. Because if you're borrowing a 10-year bond, that's around an odd 10%, 11%. If it's an infrastructure bond, an odd uh, 14%, 12%. Yeah, compared to a euro bond which you are borrowing at 5-6%. Definitely what comes with uh, a euro bond is the foreign currency risk which can always be uh, ma uh, managed well. And Joroge has managed to do that quite quite well with an iron fist. Um, but if the government continues borrowing the way it borrows on the domestic market, then you realize funding goes more to government. And the government in itself is a poor allocator of capital. Yeah, what do I mean? Most of the capital goes to recurrent expenditure and debt and doesn't go to development. So banks, pension funds, unit trust funds sit on a lot of money. But if you look at the asset allocation, 70% of their money is in government securities. Why? Because the government is paying better than anyone else at a, at a less risk. And that is only going to start changing when they start reducing their budget deficit. But you'll always hear this nice term that our budget deficit is reduced compared to GDP, uh, our this, our debt compared to GDP. Uh, but I've just told you that the GDP figures they're using don't look sound, especially the ones that they've projected. So if you take the 10.1 trillion GDP that was in 2019, and we say it grew by 1%, that would be 10.3, 10.4. It's not going far. Our debt to GDP today would be 80% to 90%. Not even 60%. Right. We are actually in debt distress. That's the truth of the matter. Wow. Yeah. Uh, when they say our deficit is reduced to GDP, but they're using a GDP of 12 trillion. When GDP really is around 10 trillion. So you look like, oh no, we've actually reduced, but the GDP is being inflated. Yeah. When they say our deficit is only 7%, I'm thinking, don't look at deficit, look at revenue versus expenditure. We don't eat GDP. Yeah, and you don't pay your expenditure from GDP. You pay expenditure from the taxes you've collected. So you've collected two trillion. You are spending three point six. That's the gap, and that gap has been there for quite, especially during the jubilee reign, around thirty eight percent, thirty seven percent between revenue and expenditure. That means every year you are spending thirty to thirty eight percent more than uh, you make in revenue. Basically, is we're living way above our means. That's what we're doing. Yes, we, we have been doing that, um, and it's by design. Uh, not, I hope it's by design which has an intended goal and not of, out of uh, ignorance. Kenya is a labor-intensive country or a labor-intensive economy, yeah? but we have pursued a capital-intensive growth, and we are a capital-deficit country. That means we have less capital, but we have abundance of labor. A lot of people who can work, a lot of people who are skilled, who can work, um, who are out there. So when you pursue a capital-intensive economic growth in a capital-deficit economy, you end up borrowing and borrowing. Yeah? Borrowing itself is not bad, yeah? as long as the borrowing has a return on investment. Yeah? You build uh, an expressway, uh, an aerobic expressway, this one that is being built here, and you say, okay, so what are going to be the economic benefits of building? Can we quantify them? Yeah? People say, oh, no, it will take three minutes from somewhere to somewhere. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, it has taken you three minutes. But when the person reaches their destination, what is their productivity in terms of adding to uh, the economic growth? The problem that we've also been doing is we've pursued um, a, a capital-intensive uh, economic growth model, which is not necessarily... Uh, beneficial to, to, to the country. Look at how the economy has been growing vis-a-vis -vis jobs, yeah, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, incomes. And that's why people say that, but okay, the economy has grown by five, but where are the jobs? So if your economic model is increasing through government expenditure, but you are not creating employment, that is not sustainable uh, economic growth. Um, and I said, I hope it's by design, mm -hmm. because sometimes I think we, we treat economic symptoms um, and not the problem. The expressway is because there's traffic, we need to decongest Nairobi. That's treating an economic symptom. Yeah. What is the symptom? 
is we have impoverished the rural economy that anyone who reaches of age wants to come to Nairobi to look for a job. Because that's where everything is being done. Uh, businesses are being done there instead of being devolved to where people are. If we pursue a labor-intensive uh, economic growth model where we are creating jobs where people are, someone can be born in Kakamega or in Machakos uh, or in Kilifi, grow up there never wanting to even come to Nairobi, maybe to come for holiday, yeah, you know, see the buildings and, and, and all. But the state we are as a country is everyone grows up, they know when you reach 16, go to Nairobi go to Nairobi. So we have congestion in Nairobi, not because uh, the economy is booming, it's because we have killed the rural economy. Yeah, We've not invested in the rural economy. Um, and the rural economy is majority 90% agricultural. Look at the budget, they say only 70 billion is going to agriculture. Uh, then the same president comes and says, food security is one of my big four. But I'm thinking, national treasury has gotten 334 billion. Uh, compared to agriculture, which has only gotten 70 billion. Uh, that shows you that there's a problem there in terms of uh, priority. So unless we start growing the rural economy and making devolution work where it's supposed to, to work, creating jobs in those areas, then you realize you don't need an expressway. Yeah? Because you don't have people coming. So the problem of congestion in Nairobi is because we've impoverished a rural economy we have a high rural to urban migration instead of urbanizing Kakamega, urbanizing Machakos, urbanizing those places so that we have a rural to urban but in those counties, not rural to urban, everything coming to, uh, to Nairobi. And we've done quite a lot of that where we treat symptoms. Uh, the other element of Big Four Agenda which is housing, which they are being built in Nairobi, again is treating a symptom. Why are we building houses for people to come to stay in Nairobi, instead of saying, let's grow um, Muranga County. Yeah? When Muranga start, County starts booming and urbanizing, housing will start coming up there. Private contractors will go and actually build houses there. And the government goes out of the business of doing business and just creating an environment for people to actually be able to do um, quite, quite a lot of business. So borrowing, you're going to borrow until we get um, a, a government that says, okay, we are not going to pursue a capital intensive. Yeah? We rather go to a low capital intensive growth agenda, utilize our labor as much as possible. Uh, because labor is not that expensive. Utilize our labor as much as possible so that we create enough employment. When you've created enough jobs, Jeff, when you have money in your pocket, you will start demanding, oh, I want to eat two loaves of bread. Yeah? Once you start demanding two loaves of bread, that baker needs to increase his capacity of bread. That means he has to employ more, uh, more people. Uh, because he's making more bread, he has to get more wheat from, uh, not even wheat, he has to get more uh, flour from, from the miller. The miller also has to employ more. Uh, people in pa expand his capacity. The, 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 the miller now needs to get more wheat from the, the flour. Uh, from, from, from the farmers. Uh, maybe because you cannot easily um, increase output, that means you have to pay more to get more wheat, then the farmer gets richer, and you have a ripple effect that easily goes uh, and grows the economy. So it's actually a simple thing. But I, sometimes, as I'm saying, I hope it's by design, mm. and not just out of sheer ignorance. You were talking about um, devolution a moment ago. What do the devolved counties get this time? Uh, they're going to get 406 uh, billion. Um, higher than, than last time, yeah. um, and I've heard you saying, wow, uh, again, the unfortunate thing of that is the majority of that money is going to pay salaries. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. Kenya needs to look at devolution from an economic perspective and not a political perspective. Devolution is a brilliant idea because it, it, it does uh, what I've just explained economically in terms of creating jobs where people are and stop impoverishing the rural economy. Uh, considering 70% of our economy is, uh, is um, of our country is rural uh, and agricultural. So devolution was done for political expediency and not with an economic thought. Because there are some counties that are not economically viable because of size. Um, because there are some counties that Dagoretti has more people than that, uh, than that county. Yeah? So it was done for political expediency without economic uh, thought on it. And what was devolved was the payroll and not development. So you realize of this four or six billion, majority of it goes to pay salaries, county staff salaries, county whatever. Yeah? And only close to 10-15% uh, to 20% goes to, to development. And most of that is not even utilized for, for that development. So if we don't move away from a model where 
uh, counties uh, just devolved the salary from national government to, to the counties. Because 4 6 billion is a lot of money. Yeah? Um, I think it's a lot of money even if you use central limit, even be better uh, if there was no corruption. But it has been devolved. How do we make sure that majority of it actually goes to create environments for businesses in those counties to be able to flourish, to create opportunities in those counties? So we have a county where you have a county where which has 200, 300 to 400,000 people. Yeah? Uh, even if a business starts there, he's not going to make so much money unless he's selling to other uh, other counties. So I'm saying there are some counties which are not economically viable, which need maybe to copy combined. Um, so then you have a larger population uh, to to use. And even at a national level, um, even if you live at a county level, uh, there's a reality that most Kenyans need to come to terms with, uh, is that Kenya is actually a very small economy. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you take the top nine banks in Kenya, there are total assets of the top nine banks in Kenya, so your equities, your whatever, are not half of Standard Bank, South Africa, in terms of asset size. One bank. One bank. Yeah. So we're actually a small economy. So if you're a business in Kenya and you want to become a mega business, you have to think regionally. Yeah. Because the market size is very small. So even if I'm going to start a business in Kisumu, yeah, I have to be looking at what, how can I access the whole Western region? Then you now have a big block in terms of uh, people that you can, you can service. So devolution has to be looked at from an economic perspective, um, not just a political one, so that they become viable. If you look at the average revenue all the 47 counties make, yeah, it's around 30, 38 uh, billion. Their own revenue, the ones that they generate themselves, not the ones they get from the 4 or 6 billion, is only 38 billion. And 38 billion, if you average it around 47, that's less than a billion. So you're saying each county cannot make one billion by them, by themselves. Um, then we are looking at does it then make economic sense to have a county which cannot generate one billion in revenue by itself? Then we have counties that are always dependent on uh, on central government. So treasury and uh, the government in power needs to sit down and think. Let's think of counties now from an economic perspective. How do we make these counties work so that they start? creating an environment for businesses to thrive and create jobs and start killing all the ills that we are spending on as a government so that we stop our expenditure growth um, that we are currently seeing. And once devolution and counties start working, you'll see the central budget also shrinking in terms of expenditure, in terms of uh, expenditure. And as the shrinking expenditure comes down, revenue is still going to come uh, up or even remain the same all of a sudden you're getting towards a balanced uh, budget. Is there any silver lining in this budget? Any good news, right now? Because you're painting a very worrying picture. Of uh, any good news? Any good signs? Well, in, in terms of the, the, the finance bill, um, how they're going to fund the, the, the budget, um, in terms of guys who they, they have exempted most stuff in terms of um, health, so even buying supplements um, should be, become a bit cheaper. Your, your, like your vitamin C, mm -hmm. your zinc should become cheaper. Um, majority of the things in the health sector have been exempted. Um, we just now need to see what does the 16% on the syringe, does it uh, cancel out what has been done on, uh, on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, transfer of assets from if in, into, a re, into a rate, a real estate investment trust. I think there's one for ICA that is listed on the Arabic Stock Exchange. That is also has been exempted from VAT. So you can actually build your building as an individual, come together as a cooperative, get a fund manager that can create a rate for you, put your property in a rate, get it listed so that you unlock capital to maybe do other projects. So, so, so that is um, an, another good thing. Um, another good thing that has come is at least digital test, uh, tax is no not for residents. So it's for non-resident businesses doing business in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So they have exempted the locals from from uh, from that tax. Um, when it comes to penalties, normally you know when you have uh, tax liability, your penalties that just accrue. But now if there is a ascertained refund by the commissioner, uh, they will net that off without accruing any uh, liability on uh, any interest or penalty on that liability, which is a good thing for for uh, for, for for most businesses, um, so to speak. Um, for one, I mean, remember the other day they said um, there was going to be a fuel hike, and then they stopped it. Now, the 
funny animal called IMF that we have gotten ourselves into because of our own financial mismanagement. As much as we blame COVID, the rain started eating us away before uh, COVID. COVID is just the wind that blew away the umbrella, then we realize, oh, it's, it's, it's raining, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, IMF, their modus operandum is always increase revenue, yeah, at all costs. They, they, they are not normally worried about the social impact of, of that. IMF already wanted fuel at 16% two years ago. But at that time, we were still thinking, oh, we are, you know, we are still good, we are still okay. But then we were hit properly uh, by the rain. We put our tail between our legs, went back to IMF. And IMF told us, eh, yeah, you, you know that 16% that you told us, yeah? Now, now we need that 16% as part of, the, of that. And, and they've come up with a lot of things, privatize uh, state-owned enterprises, um, uh, they've allowed them to borrow an additional five billion dollars. And one thing that people need to understand about IMF, IMF is as good as a bailout for your international creditors. They come in to make sure that you don't default so that those institutions in their countries um, don't suffer from your, your default. So they come as a bailout for their own institutions. Because when they give you money to pay whatever bank that lent you money, if they're not bailed out that bank in, in indirectly. So we will see how that goes. Um, but most probably it may come in trickling slowly. It may start as a um, eight to nine percent, then ten percent, then you're told there's a road levy that has been increased. There's a they may not put it as a direct sixteen percent, but they will find ways of putting it. Um, or if they decide what can you do? We'll just put it at sixteen percent. We will deal with inflation afterwards. Just like that. It's, 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 it's a rock and a hard place. <laughs> <laughs> I like that expression. Corona is the wind that blew the umbrella that made us realize it was raining. Okay. <laughs> what about floating another euro bond? There's been talk of that. Yeah, they have to. Uh, why? And we're going to be borrowing internationally for quite a while. Kenya has a huge dollar funding gap. What do I mean by that? We spend more dollars than we earn dollars. So look at the simple thing called import and exports. Our imports are three times our exports, or they are 300% more than our exports. Yeah? Yeah. So that means we have more demand for dollars than we are actually earning dollars. Um, our exports have been flat uh, since 2018, I guess, uh, at around $6 billion. Um, really just playing around there. They've not gone up much. Um, our imports have also been rather flat, but around 16 to 18 uh, billion uh, dollars. Yeah? Mm. Then you go and borrow. Yeah? Um, we have four point something trillion uh, in terms of uh, foreign, foreign debt, uh, external debt. You add that to the exports. So all of a sudden, your imports plus um, debt to exports comes like four or five times more, yeah, yeah. then uh, that's not even including interest. And if you take the magical remittances number, we normally have a very magical remittance number that keeps on going up. Correct. Statistically, that is not accurate. Uh, but you're saying that Kenyans in diaspora are always getting salary increments, uh, getting more money to send home. And if you notice all the times that remittances figure goes up, the first time it went up was um, 2017 spiked up by close to 40 percent and that was after the supreme court ruling around november december so kenya shilling was coming under pressure uh then last year 2020 uh, march yeah just after the announcement of whatever remittances spiked uh like this and they always spike and never come down they always spike and they continue going up um, and i always say when a government wants to hide something they will look at the figure that you cannot verify you cannot say exports have tripled was wondering okay, who's exporting, why is KRA not getting uh, higher revenue? So they look for a remittance figure and they say our remittances have grown, uh, are keeping on growing. So if you take remittances and even exports, our dollar funding gap is still uh, three times, we have a gap of um, around three times. That means we are spending three times more dollars than we are actually uh, receiving. So what does that mean? Kenya has no capacity to pay its external debt without borrowing. Wow. Wow. 
<laughs> That's painting a picture, Rachel. That is painting. If, if you had advice for Ukuri Atani right now, he's probably listening to you as we speak. Cabinet Secretary, what would you tell him? Some jobs are career killing. He should have stayed in the Ministry of Labor. There are some jobs that if you're offered, you, you decline. You say, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the confidence you have in me. But I think I'm doing very well in the Ministry of Labor. This is just setting me up. For failure. Exactly. Because he's a good guy. Uh, Yatani has brilliant ideas and the right intentions. From the day he came in, he was speaking, we need to cut our expenditure. We need to restructure our debt. But he has not been able or given room to be able to do that because of the circumstance you find yourself in. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. <laughs> Reginald Katsutu, thanks so much for your time and for breaking down this year's budget, my God. You know, they keep saying, tighten your belts. I don't know how much more we can tighten them, huh? You lose weight, then tighten more. <laughs> This is what we call... <laughs> <laughs>